going to be talking about capnography, which is the graphical representation of inspired and expired CO2. If you've watched any of my other videos, you know that I personally think that end tidal CO2 is one of the most useful and important monitoring parameters we have for anesthetized patients. This also includes patients that are sedated, recumbent, intubated for some reason, we're able to monitor them in a breath by breath fashion. So today we're going to be talking about why this tool is so valuable, how to interpret the graph that it is, that is displayed and what it all means. So first let's talk about the capnometer itself. The capnometer attaches to the end of the endotracheal tube and comes in two main styles, a mainstream adapter and a side stream adapter. Mainstream adapters have the advantage of sampling and measuring the gas at the capnometer itself. They are therefore more accurate and more time sensitive. Unfortunately, mainstream adapters are also usually much more expensive. Side stream adapters still attach to the endotracheal tube, but they aspirate the gas, carry it back to the monitor and measure the end tidal CO2 there. So because of that, they're a little less sensitive and they have a little bit more of a time delay as they manually aspirate the gas. The capnometer provides breath by breath information on not only ventilation, but also metabolism and circulation. This is because the CO2 that we are breathing off is determined by the rate of production in the tissues, CO2 exchange from the blood to the alveolus in the lungs, and CO2 removal via ventilation. The values that a capnograph gives you are your end tidal CO2, your respiratory rate, and your inspired CO2. Thus, it is the instrument that is the most sensitive to abrupt changes in your patient, which is why I love it so much. Your capnometer allows you to confirm endotracheal intubation and monitor your patient's anesthetic depth by monitoring respiratory drive and end tidal CO2 production. For those of you that are interested, your end tidal CO2 is usually within about three to five millimeters of mercury of your PaCO2, so the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the artery. However, things like the increased dead space and ventilation perfusion mismatch can drive this gradient higher. So something like a PTE is going to cause the gradient between your end tidal CO2 and your PaCO2 to be higher. So your end tidal CO2, which is the CO2, the carbon dioxide that your patient is breathing off when they exhale, can be either high or low for a couple of different reasons. A patient that has a high end tidal CO2 is not ventilating enough because that CO2 is building up in their blood and they are not exhaling it off. In the normal awake patient, the appropriate response to an elevated CO2 is going to be to breathe more. The reason for this is CO2 is actually the driving factor behind our respiratory rate. A lot of people think that our oxygen saturation is the main force behind breathing, but really it's CO2 and how CO2 affects our blood pH. What happens is an increase or decrease of CO2 will affect your blood pH, which is then measured in your brainstem, which will tell your body to either breathe more or less to maintain the appropriate level of pH in your blood. But a patient that is anesthetized has been given inhaled anesthetics, IV opioids, and other medications that can decrease the body's ability to appropriately respond to respiratory drive. Thus, our anesthetized patients are not able to respond appropriately and we will need to intervene by either decreasing their anesthetic depth or if that's not possible, then we need to start providing them positive pressure ventilation. 
Other causes of increased CO2 are increased body temperature, such as seen with malignant hyperthermia. So if you've ever anesthetized a patient that developed malignant hyperthermia, usually their end tidal CO2 will build up because their body is physically producing more carbon dioxide. So elevated CO2, hypercapnia, can have several systemic effects. Moderate levels of CO2 are a respiratory stimulant, so they will induce tachypnea or an increased respiratory rate. But at higher concentrations, exceeding 90 millimeters of mercury, CO2 actually becomes a cerebral depressant and will thus reduce respiratory drive by causing carbon dioxide narcosis. Things like anesthesia and vasopressors can actually mask the signs of hypercapnia. So you cannot assume that your entitled CO2 is normal based off of cardiovascular status alone. Alternatively, an entitled CO2 will be low if your patient is breathing more. So if they're hyperventilating because they're physically breathing off more CO2. In patients that are anesthetized, causes of a low entitled CO2 usually include pain and too light of an anesthetic depth. In anesthetized patients, other causes of a low end tidal CO2 can be increased respiratory drive from pulmonary disease, severe hypothermia causing a decrease in carbon dioxide production, and artificially low CO2 readings from a high gas flow rate such as when on a non-rebreather. Hypocapnia or low CO2 readings is usually well tolerated in patients, but it can cause cerebral vasoconstriction leading to brain hypoxia. And it can have the opposite effect of elevated CO2, meaning we will have a decreased respiratory drive, which can thus further worsen the risk for brain hypoxia. In addition, a sudden decrease in your end tidal CO2 is considered the first sign of impending cardiovascular arrest. So if your patient has a normal CO2 and it suddenly drops from 40, 10 to zero, there is a concern that your patient is arresting. Interesting enough, because CO2 is the primary control for respiratory drive, induced hypocapnia is used in free drivers to reduce their respiratory drive or reduce their feeling of the need to breathe while they're free diving. But because of the effects of low CO2 causing brain hypoxia, this is what can actually lead to lethal underwater blackouts because they have a decreased amount of oxygen in their brain and they've lost the ability to feel like they need to breathe. All right, so now let's talk about interpreting your capnogram, so the waveform produced by your capnometer. Depending on what resources you look at, the capnogram is broken down into several different phases. So today I'm gonna to be talking about five phases labeled zero through four. Phase one represents the beginning of expiration. So the CO2 will begin at zero as your anatomical dead space is expired. Your anatomical dead space being the gas within the endotracheal tube that did not participate in gas exchange and does not have a level of carbon dioxide in it. Your capnogram will begin to uptick as gas from the lungs begins to be exhaled. Phase two represents the rapid uptick in carbon dioxide as dead space ventilation ends and CO2 from the lungs is rapidly exhaled. The angle between phase two and phase three is considered your alpha angle. An advanced capnometry interpretation involves evaluating the degree of this angle, which is normally around 110 degrees. Phase three represents your alveolar plateau, and this is a mostly flat slope with a slight positive incline. And the reason for the slight positive incline is delays in alveolar emptying. Because not all areas of the lungs will have the same amount of CO2 and do not empty at the same time, it is common for the very distal regions of the lungs to contain more CO2 and because they empty later, there's a slight positive incline to phase three. This slight positive incline is the cause for your alpha angle being more than 90 degrees. The angle between phase three and phase four is your beta angle, and this is the angle that starts as you begin to inspire. The normal beta angle is around 90 degrees. Phase four represents early inhalation as CO2 that is still in your anesthetic tubing is inhaled, followed by CO2-free anesthetic gases. 
Phase zero, which depending on your reference is sometimes included in phase four or in phase one, represents continued inhalation as non-CO2 containing gas is inspired through the capnometer. All right, so now let's get into reviewing some capnogram waveforms. First, here's what a normal capnogram looks like. You can see all four of your phases. You can see the slight positive incline in phase three. You can evaluate your alpha and beta angles. Here is what hyperventilation looks like. Note that your respiratory rate is increased and your end tidal CO2 is slightly decreased. Here is hypoventilation. So note that your respiratory rate is slower and that your end tidal CO2 is slightly increased. Apnea is pretty easy to recognize a lack of breathing. Here is an example of what rebreathing looks like. So you can see that your phase zero is not returning to a baseline of zero, but is reflecting your inspired CO2. You can see this with an inadequate gas flow rate. Exhausted soda lime can look like rebreathing as well, but sometimes you will see an increase in the end tidal CO2 from breath to breath as CO2 continues to not be removed from the system. The opposite happens with at a sudden decrease in cardiovascular output, such as seen in cardiovascular arrest, you will have a sudden loss of your end tidal CO2 followed by a period of apnea or agonal breathing. This is a very common abnormality to see. This is known as cardiac oscillations. Here, the pressure from the heartbeat is altering the waveform. So you will see these cardiac oscillations or ripples of ripple effects most common in phase four and they will correspond with your heart rate. Esophageal intubation can initially look like this. You will sometimes get a CO2 reading initially from there being gas in the esophagus or in the stomach, but it'll be followed by a drop to zero CO2. So uh, when I've seen patients esophageally intubated using a capnograph and people will say like, oh, the tube must have come out because I was initially getting a CO2 reading, the cause is usually from there being some CO2 in the esophagus and stomach. So you do need to continue watching your capnograph to make sure that you're getting regular CO2 readings. A common abnormality to see in patients that are being ventilated is called the curare cleft. And this occurs when the patient attempts to take a breath during their expiratory phase of ventilation. So you can see this as a small dip during phase three of your capnogram. And this can be caused by either a patient that is too light while they're being ventilated, or a patient that has increased respiratory drive for some reason, or a patient that is paralyzed and the paralyzer is starting to wear off. Bronchoconstriction, asthma, and an endotracheal tube obstruction can all appear as alterations in the slope of phase three and changes to your alpha angle. You'll likely also see prolonged expiration and then with severe obstruction, you will completely lose that sloped incline and you can develop a shark fin shape where you have complete loss of your alpha and beta angles. An uncommon waveform to see is with endobronchial intubation or single lung intubation. In this scenario, the patient's endotracheal tube has been pushed too deep and is seated in one lung. Depending on how far the endotracheal tube is, you may have some ability to empty the non-intubated lung, in which case the intubated lung will empty quickly and the non-intubated lung will empty more slowly. This is really common in patients that are intubated during a code because most intubators are just pushing the tube in as deep as it goes before they secure it due to you know the craziness that happens during a code. So if you have a patient that was coded that is back, it's really important to check their tube depth because this is very common. All right, everyone. Well, that's just a summary of capnometry and how to interpret a capnograph. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. Otherwise, stay tuned. I'm going to be following up with videos on how to interpret thoracic radiographs and fluid therapy for the veterinary nurse.
Salut.